Uh, I hope you've all enjoyed today's panels as much as I have. Uh, we still have one more treat uh, left in store for you. Uh, we're just extraordinarily pleased uh, uh, to present a keynote lecture this afternoon uh, by Lee Epstein, who is a distinguished university professor at Washington uh, University St. Louis uh, and uh, a leading, uh, arguably the preeminent uh, scholar of uh, both empirical legal studies and especially uh, judicial uh, behavior. And her talk this afternoon is entitled Con Law uh, Meet Data, Data Meet Con Law. Uh, and without further ado, I'll turn it over to. Thank you very much, Andrew. Ever since the organizers invited me to speak with you today, I've been trying to get a sense of contemporary constitutional law studies. My approach was to flip through the top 10 law reviews as identified by Google, and then read the 55 constitutional law articles that the journals published last year. This was mostly a fun exercise because the papers covered such a wide range of topics from the usual suspects, the First Amendment, abortion and equal protection, to the less usual, policing in emergency rooms, interim executive officials and local constitutions. Where the studies were far more uniform was in their approach. Almost all invoked traditional legal methods, mostly some combination of history and doctrine to make their argument. Only 11 of the 55 articles, 20% were at their core true data studies, studies that made serious use of quantified data to advance their claims. As an empiricist, the small number of data studies in contemporary con law disappointed me, but frankly, it didn't surprise me. Nearly a decade ago, Barry Friedman, Jeff Stone, and I found much the same thing. Using far more capacious definitions of data work, we discovered that only 27% of con law articles used any data at all and less than 14% housed a table or figure. These were small numbers in their own right and were downright paltry compared with other fields in law, antitrust, bankruptcy, contracts, and on and on. Now, looking at this figure, some of you might be thinking, the lack of data in con law work is okay with us. We're right to stick to our traditional legal methods it's scholars in other fields of law who are misguided. Believe me, I understand that thinking. Trained empiricists have been some of the harshest critics of the quality of data work published in the law reviews. And I can imagine many other criticisms as well. Empirical work can be superficial, easy to manipulate to confirm the author's preconceived biases, and most useful only to prove the obvious. And last but not least, oops. last but not least, data work is sometimes so complex, confusing and contradictory that it seems to be of little use to the courts. No social scientist will ever forget the oral argument during which the chief justice called a measure of partisan gerrymandering sociological gobbledygook. As a general matter, Roberts isn't wrong. Empirical studies can suffer from many, many ills, but really any methodological approach could be challenged on similar grounds, including traditional legal methods. You know better than I, the devastating critiques of originalist studies and doctrinal analyses are subject to some of the same criticisms especially over cherry picking cases and materials. Besides, serious data studies have advantages over traditional approaches. Not only do they have the potential to provide answers to important questions about law and legal institutions, they also allow us to gauge the uncertainty of our answers and to gauge our uncertainty with some degree of precision. Let me provide a very simple example. Many contemporary commentators, oh, 
something's wrong here. Okay, I got it. Many contemporary commentators, as you probably know, have pointed to the Supreme Court's historically low approval ratings based on a Gallup poll. But what does the poll data actually show? Looking at the raw data, they seem to support the claim that the court's approval rating dropped from an average of 49% in July, 2021 to 40% in September, 21. Moreover, 40% approval is lower than the previous low of 42% in 2016. But because Gallup didn't talk to all Americans, in fact, the survey is a random sample of 1,005 adults, there's uncertainty about all these percentages. Gallup quantifies this uncertainty. Gallup quantifies this uncertainty at plus or minus four percentage points. This means that our best estimate of approval of the court in September 21 is 40%, but it could be as low as 36% or as high as 44%, ditto for 2016. In other words, there may be no difference between 2016 and now, or it's possible that 2016 was actually lower than 2021. My slides, I'm sorry, something is not advancing quite right. Okay, we're good. Now, what do you think of these claims? I'll let you decide, but aren't you glad you have an estimate of uncertainty? An estimate only a data study can provide. So again, and to be sure, I don't wanna claim that data work is a panacea, it isn't. But in a world that produces vast quantities of data on a daily basis, data that we have the capacity to act, collect and analyze. We are more than able, ever, uh, able than ever to test our assumptions, to answer important questions, and ultimately to make contributions of academic, legal, and policy consequence. Sometimes we'll come to reasonably firm conclusions. Sometimes we'll learn that what we know or what we thought we know is in fact more uncertain than we believed. In any event, to the extent that data can help us get a better grip on reality, it seems useful to try to gain that understanding. Now, these are general claims about the value of data work. What's the value of data work for Khan Law Scholarship? More pointedly, what's in it for you, a group of distinguished Khan Law Scholars? That's what I wanna to talk to you about today. So that there's no mystery about it, my answer comes in two parts, if my slides will ever cooperate here. First, con law is full of questions and assumptions that beg for empirical analysis. Answering these questions and testing these assumptions has the potential to advance our knowledge, to update the entire agenda of con law scholarship. The second part follows from the first. Because con law is rife with untested empirical claims, data also have the potential to inform the work of judges, perhaps leading to better court decisions, or at least decisions that rest on firmer ground than say cherry pick quotes from English cases, old treatises, and letters from the framers. Let's start with the value of data work for the scholarly agenda. I want to be really concrete here and you can help me out. Think for a second of claims in constitutional cases that rest on some sort of empirical assertion, assumption, or prediction. Here are a few that come to mind for me, all from Supreme Court decisions. True. Yeah. Here's another. And here's a more recent one.
Then there are the dueling claims in Trump versus Vance. Who has the better case? I'm sure you can come up with many other examples. It's the larger point though that shouldn't be missed. None of these claims can be assessed using traditional legal methods, but data work could and has helped. I think here, for example, of a study, of a study by Rebecca Brown and Andrew Martin, which asked whether Justice Kennedy got it right in Citizens United. Is it true that campaign spending doesn't affect the electorate's faith in democracy? Testing this claim could have taken several different forms. Brown and Morton decided to conduct a survey experiment. Here's one of the hypotheticals they posed with the experimental conditions highlighted in green. Take a second to read it. Note that Brown and Morton vary the contributors and the amount of contributions, such that respondents were given either Ford or the Center for Auto Safety as a contributor and 10,000 or 1 million as a contribution. Brown and Morton then asked the respondents a series of questions designed to tap the respondents' faith in democracy based on the conditions they received. These are some of the questions respondents were asked. As assessed by these and other questions, it turned out that very large contributions evoked the lowest average level of faith in democracy, regardless of who made the contribution. For example, respondents were more likely to think that Senator Martin would give greater weight to the interest of either the Center for Auto Safety or Ford than to the interest of other constituents. Based on this and other results, Brown and Martin reached the following conclusion, which they say has implications for constitutional law. Brown and Martin's research and other, the other examples so far involve assessing claims, assessing claims, assumptions, and so on embedded in court decisions. But data work can be helpful for scholarship in other ways. Let me point out two. First, most con law decisions beget questions that may have direct bearing on the doctrine they produce. Here are some simple examples from a favorite of Barry Friedman's, Miranda versus Arizona. And these questions beget even more. Structural con law disputes raise equally interesting questions. Here's a favorite of mine. In many cases, sorry, having a little trouble here, there we go. In many cases, the justices write about the states or the state's interest, but is there such a thing as the states? I'm sure you can all name constitutional cases in which the states were on opposing sides. Last term alone, there was California versus Texas and, sorry, there we go and Fulton versus City of Philadelphia, in which the states file a dueling amicus curiae briefs. Is this sort of partisan federalism the exception or now the norm, in which case the states may not be especially appropriate? These are just a few of the many examples where data studies could help answer con law questions. I'm sure you, the real con law experts, can think of many others. But let me move to methods. After reviewing the 55 con law studies published last year, 
I learned that near and dear to the hearts of many common law scholars are intellectual systems, methodologies for interpreting the constitution. Originalism, textualism, the constitution is common law, the living constitution, act of liberty, and on and on. Invariably, judges and scholars too, claim that their choice of which system to use is best, or at least better than the alternatives. But what does best mean? This is where data could be informative because scholars could put some flesh on best. There are possible benchmarks here that could be assessed against data. To my mind, the data projects we've just discussed, along with scores of others, could fundamentally change the landscape of con law scholarship to the benefit of the entire community of scholars. But these data projects pertain mostly to the output side, assessing assumptions or claims embedded in court decisions or the methods they use. What about the input side? Influencing what judges say before they say it. I raise this because it seems that many con law scholars aim their work at the judiciary, especially the Supreme Court. Is there a judicial market for data work? The data suggests yes. Indeed, by several indicators, the justices, despite all the chatter about history and text, are increasingly relying on data in their constitutional decisions. Here's one indicator from a project I started some years ago with Dick Posner and Bill Landis and have now updated through the 2020 term. We located the Supreme Court's 2000 plus con law decisions and then identified citations in those decisions to articles published in traditional law reviews versus social science type journals. This graph shows the percentage of con law decisions citing at least one law review article or at least one social science article by Chief Justice Era. As you can see, traditional law reviews relative to social science journals serve as the court's primary source of external information. That seems right. The law clerks are most familiar with law reviews. And besides, it makes sense to cite to the work of law professors who can make or break your legacy as a justice. Then again, there's a clear uptick in citations to social science journals. The percentage of cases citing at least one social science article increased from under 3% for the Warren Court to nearly 15% today. And truth be told, as we were combing through the cases, we noticed that at least some of the law review sites were to quantify data work that could have been published in social science journals. Here are two recent examples. A second indicator of a judicial market for data work comes from what the justices say in their opinions. With the exception of Barrett, who hasn't written much in con law since joining the court, our survey shows that every Roberts Court justice has made some use of empirical evidence, whether data or results, in a con law opinion. That's probably not surprising for the more pragmatic members of the court, Breyer and Kagan, but it's also true of the more historically oriented justices. One fun example, uh, come on. One fun example comes from Navarrett versus California, which dealt with whether an anonymous tip could justify a traffic stop. The historians, Thomas and Scalia, went after each other using data. Writing for the majority, Justice Thomas cited data to justify the connection between erratic and drunk driving. Justice Scalia responded in dissent with competing studies. This was no one off. Just, just, last, just last term, Thomas mentioned empirical studies in Kansas versus Glover, and it was Gorsuch who cited the empirical jury studies in a quote from Ramos we looked at a few seconds ago. Even the gobbledygook Roberts hasn't ignored data in his opinions, using it here to underscore Americans' attachment to their cell phone. 
In these examples, the justices relied on other people's data, but on the rare occasion, they've conducted their own empirical studies. In Noel Canning, Breyer drew a random sample of Bush's and Obama's recess appointments to explore whether the vacancy arose before or during the recess. He even put the data in an opinion, in an appendix to his opinion. Occasionally, the justices will include graphs. Here's an example from Sotomayor's dissent in Schutte versus Coalition to Defend Affirmative Action. The upshot is this. Comparing these mini findings on what the justices cite and write to the small number of data studies in the law reviews, there seems to be a growing disjuncture between what courts and scholars are doing in con law. And that disjuncture, uh, sorry, this is, There we go. And that disjuncture means that scholars are missing opportunities to inform judicial work. It's also a gap that may well grow as more and more of our current undergraduates, future judges are trained in and skilled at empirical analysis. It may be only a matter of time before data and the results of empirical studies become facts that judges will not only cite, but also refuse to ignore. And honestly, judges need your help because they sometimes make claims and predictions in con law cases that data studies simply belie. Here's a butte oh, from Roberts's dissent in the same-sex marriage case. Poll data show that this, <sighs> Uh, yeah, there we go. Poll data show that this wasn't exactly true at the time of Obergefell, and it certainly doesn't hold today. My slides just don't like me today. There we go. Okay, that's the tour of the value of data for the study of con law. Now, I understand that for some of you, the tour was enough. You need not hear any more from me or about data ever again. Fair enough. But for some of you, perhaps your journey is just beginning. Perhaps you believe, as I do, that more and better data studies could lead to substantial improvements in con law scholarship, judicial opinions, and public policy. If that sounds like you, how might you proceed? There are three possibilities depending upon your interests and goals. First, suppose you wanna add bits and pieces of data to your studies to assess assumptions, shore up claims, or answer questions. There are many places you can do this quickly online without much of a background in data or statistical analyses. Using the US Supreme Court databases analysis tool, for example, it's a snap to generate graphs and tables like this one, showing the number of criminal procedure cases since 2005. You can also get details on individual cases. For public opinion data, the General Social Survey, the GSS, a very high quality national survey Two allows for free online analysis, thanks to the good people at Berkeley. They've created a tool that allows you to examine survey responses over time. Suppose, for example, you're interested in free speech. The GSS has long asked questions about whether various kinds of people should be allowed to teach in a college or university. Let's look at responses to the question of whether a man who admits he's gay should be allowed to teach. You put the question in this box and you get some data output. The table I'm showing you actually goes from 1973 to 2021, but you can look at the graph and quickly see that the percentage of respondents allowing a gay man to teach has increased markedly over time from 50% in 1973 
to over 90% today. Other speaker types, I should note, don't fare so well. In 2021, only about 30% of respondents would allow an anti-American Muslim clergyman to teach. The GSS allows you to make these comparisons. Finally, Uh, come on. All right. Don't want to do that. I guess there's some, there we go. Finally, there's the Comparative Constitution Projects website, which lets researchers examine many aspects of constitutions across time and place on a specific topic. Here are some graphs generated by the site showing whether the country's constitution requires the state to provide education free of charge, 70% do. You can also compare the actual constitutional texts on a range of topics. Here's Saudi Arabia and Ireland on education. So that's one possibility for integrating data into your studies. A second speaks to those of you who might be interested in conducting full-fledged data study but don't wanna learn all the ins and outs of doing data work. If you fall into this category, you could collaborate. We saw an example earlier where Rebecca Brown, a great con law scholar, and Andrew Martin, a great statistician, collaborated to produce a really first rate study and one of interest to social scientists and con law scholars. If you look around your school, it shouldn't be hard to find someone, whether a consultant, faculty colleague, or even a PhD student who would be interested in working with you on a data project. You'd bring your rich substantive knowledge and your collaborator research design and methodological expertise. Finally, if you're interested in designing and executing studies and analyzing data on your own, just about every social science department offers a menu of introductory and advanced methodology courses and many schools of engineering, perhaps combined with departments of computer science or math, offer certificates in data analytics. However you decide to proceed, I can't help but believe that even a dose of data will lead to a consequent increase in the policy relevance and academic impact of constitutional law studies. Thanks for listening. I'm very happy to take your questions. Thank you so much, Lee. Uh, if you have questions, please type Q into the chat. I can get us started here. Um, Lee, I have a question uh, about uh, empirical, uh, quantitative empirical work on judicial behavior uh, and the potential for expanding that work uh, in particular, the study of the Supreme Court for expanding that work beyond uh, the votes of individual justices uh, to the content of their opinions, which after all uh, are what create the precedents uh, which uh, guide the future decisions of lower courts. It seems to me like this may be um, something of a new uh, horizon or frontier uh, in the empirical study of judicial behavior. I wonder if you have thoughts about uh, where the literature may be going in this area and whether there are um, particular tools, uh, new and emerging tools uh, for studying the content of opinions uh, that might be of interest to this audience. Uh, uh, sure, I, I mean, I, I, I would start by saying that I think the study of judicial behavior is now much, much expanded beyond the votes of justices. I mean, lots and lots of their choices have come under analysis. So, but, but still met much of that work isn't really digging into the content of judicial decisions in the way I think that you're suggesting. Um, there are certainly, uh, be, I, I wanna say that we're taking baby steps at the moment with serious uh, analyses, and I would say automated analyses of judicial decisions. I'll give you a very quick example of something we just finished 
not exactly on the content of judicial decisions, but using language to study a feature of uh, judicial behavior, and that's aging on the Supreme Court. So uh, researchers in, in Alzheimer's research have noted that there are certain linguistic markers that are suggestive of cognitive decline, sometimes serious cognitive decline. So we've taken some of their linguistic markers and applied them to questions that justices asked during oral argument um, and, uh, and use that to kind of assess aging, if you will, on the bench. So there are, there are a lot of efforts right now. The biggest single problem I think that, that confronts this sort of work is a lot of the work depends on kind of dictionaries. You know, and in our study of aging, we have these validated linguistic markers, the use of filler words, for example, or nonspecific nouns. Um, a lot of these dictionaries that have been developed, they haven't been developed for legal language, for courts, uh, for the kind of writing that judges do. Nonetheless, they're being applied to those judicial decisions. And I personally don't think that makes a lot of sense. And I know a lot of other researchers in the field do as well. So I do think this kind of work is gonna depend greatly on collaboration with lawyers to develop the kind of dictionaries that are needed to do the serious content work. That's a long answer, but. Thank you very much. Um, next question is from Guha. Um, yes, so one thing um, I worry about with respect to survey results, it really depends on kind of how you use it. And we see, especially with Bostock, a lot of scholarship that uses like MTurk and uh, these kinds of uh, mechanisms to get, you know, survey answers. And I found that there are like lots of sort of methodological problems with that, like are the survey respondents really, you know, thinking about these questions and these questions are really difficult to answer. And I just wanted to know if you had any reflections on those kinds of methodologies that are coming up to provide the data for uh, some of these, you know, really contestable questions. Thank you, that's an excellent question. So let me distinguish between two kinds of surveys. One kind of survey is what you're used to, you know, you, you're asked a particular question, you know, on a seven point scale, are you a Democrat, a strong Democrat, that, that sort of basic survey question. Then there are experiments embedded within surveys, and that's the, the Brown and Martin uh, survey of the Brown and Martin research that I showed you, where they embedded actually an experiment within a survey. We worry a little less about those because we are randomly assigning the respondents to one of the conditions. Um, but, you know, there's still questions about how do you frame the questions and so on. Survey research is, uh, is a real science. Uh, you know, our students take in political science, they'll take a full semester, if not a year on survey research. So it's, you're right. So there's a lot of ins and outs here. If you look at something like the general social survey, which I showed you, um, those people, they're really good, right? They know how to develop the sample. They know how to write the questions. It's a, if you're going to use survey data, that's a terrific one. The MTurk survey, so I don't know if you know about, um, you know, Amazon has a program where you can hire people to actually take surveys for you. And these have become increasingly, or participate in experiments, these have become increasingly common in the social sciences. And um, there's, a, there's a evidence that used correctly, these, uh, the results from these uh, quote MTurk surveys can be a pretty high quality. Now you specifically asked, how do you know they're just not pushing buttons <laughs> you know, that they're actually taking the survey work seriously? Well, most surveys will have like attention checks built in them. 
um, I just did a, an MTurk experiment actually, where we had several of these attention questions. And, and one was like, don't answer this question, you know, if you're paying attention. And, you know, a certain fraction of the people are going <laughs> to are not paying attention and they're just putting pushing buttons. But survey researchers who know what they, they're doing, and I'm, by the way, I'm not one of them. I'm not a survey researcher. I work with people who know what they're doing. Um, they're pretty good at this. Uh, Gerard is next. Yes, hi, Lee. Thank you for the talk. Um, I guess one question I have for you might be, are you confining your thought here only to scholarship or are you also including advocacy? And the reason I ask that is because McCluskey versus Kemp would yeah. seem to stand as something of a precedent against the use of or the persuasiveness of statistical evidence or empirical research in a highly contested case, right? That is, there was an exemplary study there doing, say, in effect, exactly what you've just said. And the court simply came close to saying, yeah, but we're, we're still not gonna, you know, go with what this, this study conclusively shows. So I'm just wondering if you had any thoughts about that, because of course, as for scholarship itself, I, I agree with you entirely. Thanks. Oh, great question. You know, sure. And we could look at uh, Robert's gobbledygook in the partisan gerrymandering case, which was, uh, you know, rejecting what many of us thought or, or many people thought was a pretty good measure of partisan gerrymandering um, based on a lot of a lot of empirical analysis. Um, yeah, sure. You know, uh, when was McCleskey? 1987? Well, you know, my hope is that the, and I said this in my talk, you know, our undergraduate students now are becoming pretty adept at data analysis and statistics um, it, through, you know, throughout, it doesn't matter what they're majoring, throughout they're learning these, these techniques. And, you know, my hope is if not the judges today, but maybe the judges of tomorrow will be more understanding of the empirical work and I think advocates have to do a good job explaining it to the judges. They don't, you know, I, I, I've trained judges in statistics and empirical analysis, and, um, and they, they need explanation as to what's going on here. I think the most important aspect of the statistical work for advocacy to me is the ability to ex express our uncertainty about our results. You know, we can, you, you can, you can go to, you can present data and say, look, um, here's our data point. There's some uncertainty about it, but even if you're at the low end of that uncertainty, it still looks pretty good. It still looks like you should take this seriously. So yes, um, I think, I think Judges, as they come up, are going to understand statistical work more. And for the judges on the bench, I think they need, I think they need explanation as to why this is useful, valuable, if they care about implications of their decisions. Tony Massaro. Hi, I, I, I really just have an observation. I so appreciate your work um, and just talked about it with my first year Khan Law students, um, I'm, I'm especially interested in the work on judicial voting patterns and the more sophisticated it gets, I think um, it, it undermines the justices at rest claims about what they're doing when you've got uh, increasingly sophisticated data about what they're, the justice in action is actually doing. So keep it up, I think it's great. Um, and, and, and yeah, I share Gerard's concern about selective use of data or poor use of it. I think of the interactive violent video case and you know, take, relying on studies that nobody in the field really thinks were the best ones. But I think it's, it's better than not having the data. Um, uh, so thank you for your work and thank you for coming to this. Thank you, Tony. You know, it's really interesting. A lot of times I get exactly the opposite response to my work where people would say, aren't you harming the judiciary? Isn't all this data harming uh, the public's view of courts? Uh, you know, my answer is always usually something like, you know, I, there's very few uh, 
examples I can think of where more information is worse than less information. So I, I think the public should, I think, un have an understanding. And I don't think it's particularly undermined uh, the courts to have that understanding because I think the public knows that on some occasions, in some kinds of disputes, the justices are highly partisan and highly ideological. Aaron Kaplan. <coughs> oh, I picked pick the perfect time to have a coughing fit. Um, thanks for your presentation. I had a question that is in, in some ways similar to Gerard's. I mean, there, there are some lines of cases where it feels to me like the best explanation for the judge's ruling is they just don't like numbers. Like if you think of the Michigan affirmative action cases, the plan that went through was the one without numbers in it. And then the one that flunked was the one with numbers in it. And then similar for Washington v. Davis and so on. So there's some education that has to happen there on the front end. But what I'm especially wondering your thoughts on are um, the studies that are specifically designed to test an empirical statement of the courts uh, that came out in a court opinion. And one I use in civil procedure all the time that you may be familiar with involved Scott v. Harris. Uh, it was a car chase case where the Supreme Court said, oh, no reasonable juror would ever think X. And then there was a study with a bunch of focus groups and they said, yeah, lots of these reasonable jurors thought X. So I know you're not in a position to, to answer the question of can, can the Supreme Court justices be shamed? <laughs> uh, but I am wondering, uh, you know, as someone who selects research projects, where do you, how would you rank, you know, the value of, you know, hey, we ju they just made an empirical assertion and now we're going to test it and see if they were right or not. You know, I, I, to me, that, ha that has a lot of value. Again, I'll point to the Brown and Morton study because that's exactly what it was, right? They wanted to test an assertion that Justice Kennedy made in Citizens United about contributions undermining faith and democracy. And I mean, that's, that's, are they gonna overturn Citizens United tomorrow? No, but if, you know, given, given who's on the court, but it, at some point um, there may be justices more sympathetic to those kinds of arguments. Uh, you know, that goes back to what Tony said, you know, there's gonna be a lot of motivated reasoning on, on the court. They're gonna use what they want to, to, to get to the conclusion that they want. Um, but that doesn't under, to me, that doesn't undermine the value of uh, assessing these assertions. And, you know, at some point, who knows? In the future, the more this kind of evidence builds up, the more it speaks to me to rethinking some of these decisions. History has played that role. Look at the switch from Bowers to Lawrence. I mean, the, the historical evidence was, uh, at least the justices said was convincing to get them to rethink uh, Bowers. So I don't know why data can't play that, play a similar role. Eunice Lee. Hi, Hi Lee, thank you so much for this really fascinating presentation. And I guess my question was along the lines of what constitutes data. Um, and <laughs> I guess related to that, you know, methods, so sort of similar to Aaron's um, line of questioning, I was curious to know what types of da data generated how um, are needed um, and are persuasive. We've talked, I know about type survey responses, Aaron mentioned focus groups, but there's other types of data, um, you know, in the universe of data, qualitative coding data, my own training, I think it's probably the least persuasive form of data, which is ethnographic. Um, but I just wanted to hear more of your thoughts on, yeah, sort of the range of different types of data analysis that could be useful. Well, you know, there's an old saying, data or data, methods or methods, right? Um, which you pick should depend on your project. 
right? And, and for some projects, the only data that you're going to be able to collect are ethnographic data, right? For, for some projects, you can uh, quantify some phenomenon and collect millions of observations. It really, it really depends on the, the project, your interest, and your goals. Now, the one thing about um, the kind of, kind of quantified data, data study, or even just a piece of quantified data, is that you can assess uncertainty. Um, and you, it's, that's hard to do with other kinds of data to apply kind of statistical analyses to get indicators of uncertainty. I mean, not to put too fine a point on this, everyone here, but you know, the whole field of statistics is really about quantifying uncertainty. So if you want to get, you know, to gauge how certain you are, or uncertain you are about something, then, then you're going to have to do probably some kind of statistical analyses. But I am completely agnostic as to data methods really just depends on your project. Sure. Uh, thanks so much for the presentation. Um, I had a question that's kind of along uh, the lines of Guha's question, I think. Um, and so I think, um, you know, I think the basic thrust of your argument or presentation is that data is good and we should look for more data in the world. And I think, you know, I think what you mean is like accurate data is good. And I guess my concern is about inaccurate data because inaccurate data is worse than no data at all, I think. And so I do worry about scholars and especially about judges who are not trained in, in distinguishing between accurate and inaccurate or good or well, well, you know, good methodology or bad methodology in data. And so you worry about motivated reasoning. And so one question I had um, among others, is do we have data on the data that judges cite? So do we have data on how often they cite accurate or good or data that's based on good methods versus how often they cite data that's better based on bad, bad methods? You can do the same thing for law review articles. So instead of kind of cataloging how often they cite the studies, but how often do they cite the good and bad studies? Oh, well, that's fun. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. If there's been a study on data, the quality of data, um, the one thing I will say is that there's certainly benchmarks that we use to assess, you know, the quality of a study. Um, so we're going to look at things like uh, the validity of the measures, the reliability, the um, you know, just the research design, the identification, all, all kinds of things that that we're going to look at. But, you know, I don't, I honestly don't know the answer to that question if anybody's done that kind of study. I think it goes to your broader, you know, because if, if they're using bad data, then maybe more data, you know, maybe we don't oh, want sure. to. Oh, yeah. sure. I, I, I'm not, you know, I'm not saying every, you know, the, go out and start doing data. That's, that, that's not my, my uh, pitch to you. My pitch to you is that you know, having gone through a lot of law review articles, um, they're, they're, they're all pretty similar in approach. And that I, as I read them, they make a lot of empirical claims themselves. Forget about what the judges are saying. The articles themselves make a lot of empirical claims that really aren't particularly well supported. And my view is that that bringing some data to the table, however you want to do that, and I, I made some suggestions, I think would have uh, good effects on constitutional law scholarship and ultimately in judicial opinions. We have a comment uh, from uh, Paul Julian uh, in the chat who says, Professor Epstein, your presentation, meeting data and meeting con laws rekindled thoughts. I've been thinking about for decades AIDS, but never framed it as you have today. I suspect that judges, uh, not just in the appellate courts, but judges in the trial courts, all have the opportunity to apply this information. I'm thinking this would be a valuable presentation at our annual judicial uh, conference. Oh, that's very, that's very, very nice comment. You know, I do do a lot of presentations for judges. And um, Unless I talk about ideology or partisanship of judges, they're actually really interested in this kind of work. Uh, they're interested. It, if somebody asked before, you know, about uh, uh, about Scott versus Harris, or you know, validating claims 
in their own opinions. They're really interested in that. Now, you know, whether that's going to lead them one way or another in a case, I don't know, but they're interested in it. They're interested in studies of their own behavior. They're especially interested in studies that show various kinds of biases, ideology and partisanship aside. So thank you, that's a nice, that's a very nice comment. I had a follow-up question, uh, which I think builds on Gerard's uh, and Aaron's questions earlier, which is, uh, which is maybe a different way of thinking about the same question, uh, which is whether uh, the empirical research, including your uh, extensive empirical research on the role that ideology plays in judicial decision making, makes you more pessimistic uh, about uh, the impact uh, that additional quantitative or empirical research might have on uh, judicial decision making, if that decision making is in fact primarily motivated by ideology rather than uh, by uh, the arguments uh, of parties or legal doctrine or presumably empirical facts. Um, is that a reason to be pessimistic uh, that this kind of research might have the kind of impact that you are, uh, you seem hopeful that it might? Oh, you mean, I, I, guess, I guess I'm not quite understanding the question. You mean the impact on judges, the impact on the public, the- Impact on judges specifically. I realize well, that's not the only, the only benefit that you, um, uh, you see in this kind of work, but to the extent that one benefit of this work uh, is uh, maybe one of the two main benefits that you emphasized here is its potential to persuade uh, judges. Um, does mm -hmm. the empirical finding that ideology plays mm -hmm. uh, a dominant role in judicial decision making um, cast doubt on, the, uh, on this thesis that you presented to us today? Well, you know, I, I think, I mean, they, they don't like it. So, you know, if you talk to judges about ideology, the first thing they do is push back, right? And so the Supreme Court justices, they'll push back with a very simple piece of data. And it's a piece of data they love. Even on the US Supreme Court, 40% of their decisions are unanimous, right? So that's, that's the big pushback. And that's fair, right? Um, much of the work on ideology uh, tends to show, and partisanship tends to show, that it comes into play in the highly salient, especially con law disputes, right? So there's a large portion of what even the US Supreme Court, maybe the most political court in the world does, that is, you could characterize it as legalistic in some sort of way. And I, I believe that to be true. And then there's the question, and you raised this, Andrew, it was your first question. There's the point that um, the ideological studies are mostly voting studies, right? So it doesn't get to the content of the opinion. Um, and, and I think that th those are huge open areas for exploration. Thank you very much, Lee. Do we have any other questions? I see a question from Rebecca. Oh, I see. Perfect. Rebecca, thank you. Thanks so much for this presentation. It reminded me of something else that Justice Roberts said about legal scholarship. Um, I had, of course, been thinking about the sociological gobbledygook um, quote, but before that, he made a remark about how if you pick up a law review, the article that you're most likely to see is something about the effect of Immanuel Kant on you know, 18th, century, 18th century evidence law in Bulgaria. Um, and so maybe that suggests that he was not particularly receptive um, to any form of legal scholarship so that he wasn't necessarily selecting out empirical work for disfavor. <laughs> yeah, well, that's probably true. But if you put, if you produced a study showing that the Roberts Court, that John Roberts has done a remarkable job uh, bringing doctrinal coherence, uh, consensus, stability to the law, and you use numbers to do it, I'm sure he would love that. It looks like that's 
to all the questions that we have for today. Thank you, Lee, uh, so much for this, uh, this extremely stimulating uh, talk. Thanks to all of you uh, for joining us uh, here today and sticking it out through um, a long series of panels and this fascinating uh, lecture. Uh, on behalf uh, of uh, the Rehnquist Center and my co-organizers, um, Shalev Roisman, Eunice Lee, uh, David Schwartz, and Rebecca Avil, uh, we're just extremely grateful that you have uh, helped us to make this such uh, an enjoyable event. And we very much hope to see many of you uh, in Tucson uh, next year uh, in person. Thank you so much. Thank you.